Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, producer and also an occasional host. On this episode, I'm happy to bring you a conversation with National Review Senior Editor Jonah Goldberg on his latest book, Suicide of the West. Jonah will also be speaking at our upcoming annual conference, Acton University, and it's held here in Grand Rapids. And if you want, you can still register to hear him during the plenary dinner on Wednesday, June 19. Then on the second segment in this episode, James Patterson, who's a professor of politics at Ave Maria University, joins us to talk about the legacy of Fulton J. Sheen, a priest in America who is primarily known for his popular books, radio broadcasts, and Emmy award-winning television show, Life is Worth Living. But he was also a deft and serious thinker on efforts to bring Americans in closer alignment with the Christian tradition, especially that of the Catholic Church. You'll find all the links for the event registration or more reading materials in our show notes, posted every Wednesday to blog.actin.org. And of course, if you like this podcast, please do not forget to subscribe at actin.org slash line. Welcome to Act in Line. My name is Jordan Baller. I'm a senior research fellow here at the Acton Institute, and it's my great pleasure to introduce a conversation with Jonah Goldberg. He's the Asnes Chair in Applied Liberty at the American Enterprise Institute, a senior editor at the, Nas- at the National Review, and a fellow at the National Review Institute. He's going to be speaking at this year's Acton University here in Grand Rapids on Wednesday, June 19th, 2019. And uh, Jonah, thanks so much for, for joining us on this podcast. Absolutely delighted to be here. Jonah, um, your latest book is called Suicide of the West, and a lot of our time here in this podcast is going to be focusing on on the arguments you make in that book. Can you introduce the kind of central thesis of the book? What, what's your basic argument? Sure. I mean, uh, at, particularly for folks who are aware of, supportive of, or involved in the Acton Institute's message, little of it will come as a huge shock. But one of the things I, I trying to do with the book is actually argue on progressive terms or lib- whatever label you want to put it, liberal, progressive, secular terms, to say that that on their own terms, right, broadly understood as sort of the enlightened left, um, on their own terms, liberal democratic capitalism is the greatest and arguably the only thing that has improved most of the the issues or concerns that they have, right? When you ask a liberal or a progressive, why are they interested in politics? Why are they interested in the state doing more? And ask them to list the things that they think the state should be, that the government should be involved in. My argument is whether it's educating people, uh, reducing poverty, improving nutrition, improving public health, you can go down a very long list. Most of those things are actually improved by liberal democratic capitalism, and I try to argue on those terms. So I rely on evolutionary arguments. I rely on – I go where the data takes me. And the simple fact is, which is not really disputed by any serious – anthropologist, economic historian, or anybody, is that for almost all of humanity's time on Earth until about 300 years ago, the average human being everywhere on the planet lived on no more than $3 a day. And then once and only once in all of human history did that start to change. And it only started to change in one place at one time. And um, I call that the miracle because it wasn't planned. It was sudden. I don't say, I don't argue that it comes from God. I'm perfectly comfortable with the argument that it comes from God, but I'm trying to persuade people who may or may not believe in God and appeals to the authority of the divine aren't persuasive to people who don't recognize the authority of the divine. And so my argument is that we stumbled into this essentially accidentally. It wasn't planned. And because of that, because of this miracle, we should have even more gratitude for it, and we should work harder to protect it. Because if it's something that we didn't intend to create, um, we should be very careful not to destroy it. And that's sort of the overarching sort of perspective I'm coming from in the book. But as you as you know, if you've looked at the book, it covers a lot of territory. Yeah, absolutely. And it speaks to your erudition um, and your ability. I mean, I've always admired your, your writing um, to communicate in a way that's... Uh, 
enjoyable to read. So it's a, it's, it's a, there's a lot of learning in this book, but it's accessible. Um, and so that's a, a testament to your talents. And just one way into that is the very first line of the book is, there is no God in this book. So speaking from an institute that, uh, whose, whose uh, mission includes the study of religion and liberty, um, that was kind of the angle I wanted to go, and you introduced it there in, in, in restating your thesis. Yeah, I was trying to anticipate the... Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> no, I mean, I appreciate it. So it's, it's, a, it's a work of persuasion in that sense. So you're trying to understand people who you may disagree with on various points and get inside their perspective and argue from their their sort of view of the world, which is all too often not the kinds of discourse that we see in the public square today. Uh, maybe we can get back to that in a minute. But what I want to focus more on what you called the miracle. Um, we could talk a little bit about the interesting dynamic there where you say there's no God in this book, but then there's a miracle right, right away there uh, in the title yeah, also, of that. <laughs> and, and God kind of sneaks in at the end, too. He does. So, so yeah, uh, I, I do want to come back around to that, too. Um, speaking as a theologian, those are some interesting elements there, how those things relate. I do want to focus, though, specifically on kind of the empirical argument or where the data takes you, as you were saying earlier. On, on page eight in the book, for example, there's what's been called the most important chart uh, in all of human history. It's the, the, the other hockey stick. So many people are familiar with the climate change hockey stick. There's the GDP per capita hockey stick of basically human history. And it, it's, it's striking. Um, you say that there are lots of other measures, and so GDP per capita is a kind of a proxy. What are some of the other measures that really are salient for you or you think should be salient for the kinds of people you're trying to persuade in this book? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, and I, I'm actually against the sort of approach, the sort of modernist approach of reducing all of human affairs down to data and wonkery. But if you're dealing with people who do that, Sometimes you have to use the stuff that they find persuasive, and uh, that's why I use a lot of data and wonkery. Um, that said, you know, I mean, to put it in more human terms, a hundred years ago, forget three hundred years ago, never mind five thousand or ten thousand years ago, just a hundred years ago, it was normal in this country, which at the time was arguably the richest country in the world, for families to experience the death of at least one child. That was a normal experience. It didn't necessarily happen to every family, but odds are that pretty much every family knew a family to whom it happened. Um, Calvin Coolidge, when he was president of the United States, his son was playing tennis on the White House tennis courts, and he got a blister on his foot. It got infected, and he was dead a week later. That was normal. It doesn't mean it wasn't tragic. Every life is sacred. But today, when we talk about the, de the, the idea of a death of one's child feels so much more cosmically horrible because it is so rare. And you can take metrics like that across a wide spectrum of human life. Just about the amount of time and labor it took to produce the resources that are necessary for a single meal or to generate a single hour of candlelight that you could read by. And you could go down, and I, at the end of the book, I have this appendix that runs through a lot of this data. And in almost every single regard that you can think of, we have gotten unimaginably richer because of these ideas that change the world, that come out, that have, that have a lot of indebtedness to Christianity, to Judaism, but really hit a critical mass about 300, 350 years ago in England and arguably the Netherlands. Um, I call I, I focus on on England. There are people who say it really starts in the Netherlands, and you know if there's some some Dutch jingoists out there, we can have that <laughs> argument. But regardless, um, it's this thing that just suddenly changes. That's where the hockey stick takes off, and it's still going up, straight up. You know, in ways that are unimaginable. We live in the single greatest moment of poverty alleviation in all of human history. Hundreds of millions, billions of people have been lifted out of extreme poverty in the last 30 years. And we don't celebrate it, um, in part because the reason that happened is not the UN. The reason that happened are these ideas that are encaptured in what I call the Lockean Revolution that unleashed human potential and human flourishing in ways that were unimaginable you know, uh, 500 years ago. Well, you, you will be coming here to West Michigan, so you, you may want to throw a line in there about the Holland America, Anglo-American Anglo line of liberty or something <laughs> like that. You've got a great line in the book that uh, reminds, you know, us of the, the, the Thomas Hobbes definition of the state of nature. You say, the natural state of mankind is grind, grinding poverty, punctuated by horrific violence, terminating with an early death. 
And it was like this for a very, very short time, which you just uh, encapsulated there for us again. And so this is the, the change in this, the move out of this is the kind of baseline for what we normally experience every day is what you call this miracle. What is it about us that we, we don't appreciate it? What is it about human nature that leads us to not have a kind of a, a perspective of gratitude for understanding where we've been as a, as a species and where we are and where, maybe where we're going? Right. So, I mean, there, there, there are two factors at play. One is human nature and one is the role of ideas. Um, ideas are what gave birth to the miracle. If democracy and human rights and free markets and innovation were the natural way of organizing societies, they would have showed up in the evolutionary record a little earlier than the 300 or 400,000 years since we split off from the Neanderthals. Um, ideas change things. And um, ideas still control things. So part of it is, is that we're coming up with ideas that tell us that capitalism is evil, that it's racist, um, that it's exploitative, um, all of these things which you think would no longer be persuasive in a day and age given the accomplishments that, that, that liberal democratic capitalism can rack up. The other part of it is human nature. And part of that is simply that we have a tendency to, to believe that the, the time we're born into is normal. And then, we're, therefore, we kind of take it for granted that this is the way things are supposed to be, which is sort of insane because this this entire explosion of prosperity basically unfolds over the length of about six lifetimes. And prior to that, you know, the 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 you know, I can't remember the name of the economist, but he says, you know, the average uh, English citizen lived no better than the lifestyle of Roman legionnaires 2,000 years earlier. It was a flat line for all that time. And so part of it is the human nature to take things for granted, to think, to, to think that this is normal. But then there's also the role that human nature plays in, in, in the development of ideas. And I see this turning away, turning our backs on the, the gratitude that we should have for the miracle, but also turning our backs on the role that religion plays and sort of being God-fearing and thinking that there is an external moral authority that keeps us on the straight and narrow, which played such an important role in the sort of Max Weber thesis about the Protestant work ethic. Um, when we sort of turn in, inward and listen to our own instincts and our own emotions as if they're the highest form of moral authority, that's a form of corruption. And that's a big problem that we have in society today, where we teach people, teach kids from a very early lesson, very early age, go with your gut, be true to yourself, you know, um, go with your instincts. And I always like to say to people, you know, it is almost the very definition of a bad parent who says to their three-year-old toddler, Go with your instincts. <laughs> right. right. Go ahead, run with those scissors. <laughs> you know, right. Like, sure. See if you can fly. And but we've intellectualized this. And then there's a whole class of what you know Joseph Schumpeter might call the new class of these intellectuals who and bureaucrats and managers who manipulate ideas and institutions in ways that benefit themselves. And the education bureaucracy is a big part of this, where we teach people that not only is their past something that they need to forget and overcome because it is so evil, but we also tell them that because of the past, that they are born into a world uh, full of entitlement, right, which is the opposite of gratitude. Gratitude is where you look at the world and you see what's lovely and, or lovable, and you say, gosh, this is great. I don't want to lose this. That was that emotion that overcame so many people when the Cathedral of Notre Dame was on fire was, oh my gosh, we might lose this. I love this place. And, and we took it for granted. You know, we assumed we it, it was always going to be there. Right. Yeah. An entitlement, sense of entitlement and resentment, which is what we teach as a matter of pedagogy, as a matter of popular culture, tells people that the world owes them something, that they have a reason to be pissed off, that they have a reason to think the system is rigged against them. And therefore, everything that the system does give them, like longer lives, better health, stuffed crust pizza, better dentistry, all of these things, they think think they're entitled to rather than something that they should be grateful for. And that becomes poisonous and almost suicidal. So who should we be grateful to? That's the kind of question that, I mean, right. So you're arguing from the beginning from within this kind of a, uh, a perspective, a, a, a temporal perspective, say, for example, because you're trying to convince people who may or may not believe in God. But isn't it really hard to be grateful to some impersonal force or to the 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 fates or to something that's um, 
you know, chance that's driving human history. Um, what role does God play in giving us someone to be grateful to for all these things? Sure. Look, I mean, first of all, I mean, I say this again, I don't like reducing things down to social science, but as a, as a social scientific matter, if you live your life oriented in such a way that you daily express gratitude for God and for your family and for the things that God has provided for you, odds are you're going to do pretty well along the lines of the normal conventional you know, metrics of success in life. Um, that's pretty borne out. But uh, I don't think that's why you sh- I mean, you, you shouldn't be doing I'm not a preacher of the prosperity gospel, right? I mean, that's not why you should do it, but it's nice that it works out that way. Um, that said, you know, the working title of the book was for a long time, uh, The Tribe of Liberty. And the argument I wanted to make, and which I still believe in, is that our attachment to liberty, and, and I don't mean I just mean I don't mean unfettered license, and I don't mean sort of unqualified freedom, but our attachment to liberty and the institutions enshrined in the American founding documents and the Gettysburg Address and Martin Luther King's uh, "I Have a Dream" speech, if we make these things not just some set of abstract principles that we're supposed to agree on, but actually things that we are passionate, that form the habits of our heart. Right? Almost all of the liberties that we cherish in this country, or at least that we're supposed to cherish, have their beginning not as a list of abstract principles, but as these weird, quirky customs and norms that had to do with British or English culture. And they weren't taught as, as, you know, texts. They were lived as a lived experience. And that's one of the things that I think we, that parents need to do, that communities need to do, is, is teach that stuff and model that stuff as if it's something that we live and breathe rather than something that just gives us good stuff. Um, but beyond that, I desperately want to teach the bad stuff that happens in American history. Um, you have to teach that stuff. My problem with the way the Howard Zins and other practitioners of sort of left-wing um, history teaching work is that they want to basically pick only the bad things and say not only do these define us as a people and define us as a nation, but their evil is such that they'll never shrink in the rearview mirror, that we'll never overcome them, and that it is a sort of a a a, a, a poisonous indictment of the system itself. And so take slavery. Look, I want to teach that we had slavery, but so did every major civilization in human history. The remarkable thing about the West isn't that we had slavery, but that we got rid of it. And the fact that it, the, the fact is, is that so many of the things that people use as an indictment against the founding and against our founding principles um, boil down to the argument of hypocrisy. Well, the thing is, is that, you know, hypocrisy is only possible when you have principles. If you're just a simple barbarian glutton who doesn't have any principles, no morality whatsoever, the only way you can be a hypocrite is if you live a decent life. Um, but if you have if you have highfalutin principles that you fail to live up up to, well, first of all, that's why we call them principles. They're difficult to live up to. I mean, Christian theology is very good on this point. It's you know, you're, it's no no one is perfect, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try try to live a Christ-like or a decent life. But second of all, it was that hypocrisy that made it possible for this nation to improve, for us to get rid of slavery, for us to get rid of Jim Crow, for us to treat our you know uh, our citizens as equals in the eyes of government and in the eyes of God, because we wanted to better fulfill the ideals and principles that this country was founded on. And that hypocrisy was the pang of guilt that you get in your conscience when your conscience isn't living up to the best version of yourself. And that's what prophets do, right? So prof- we can think of figures, some of whom we've already named, like Martin Luther King. They point to some standard, some ex- external moral order, some something that people all agree on that we should be living up to and point out explicitly this we're not we're not being our best selves or we're living out of sync with what what we profess to believe and so on. And so what I hear here, you know, the importance of ideas, obviously, in the history of liberty, in the formation of this miracle that you've talked about, but also – not just living in the realm of ideas, but embodying these things in our everyday practice. And this is this speaks to the importance of civil society, institutions beyond just the market and the state. Um, you already mentioned the family, 
so where, if we think about reform or trying to fight against these forces of corruption that you you describe in the book, where should our efforts really focus now um, in this time and place? Um, well, first of all, uh, our efforts almost always, uh, I, I guess I could imagine some hypotheticals where it's not the case, but as a general rule, um, our greatest passion and our greatest efforts should be Ex- expended closest to home in the family. I mean, I'm, as you might guess from the name Goldberg, I'm not a big, I, I believe in subsidiarity, but not as a theological doctrine. Um, but the most, you know, the fight for liberty begins in your own backyard and the fight to raise decent, honest, good people begins in your own home. And that is the most important task anybody can take up. But moreover, the, as a policy matter, and there's not a huge amount of sort of policy prescription in the book, but one of the things I do talk about, and I believe in pretty passionately, is the need to send power down to the most local level possible. That um, one of the reasons why we get these explosions of populism and anger and resentment at the system is because there is, for good reasons and bad, this this idea, this perception that people's lives are being run by people far away from where they actually live. These cold, unseen forces, whether it's the globalists or the um, the establishment or whoever, or even the Jews, right? Um, and if you send power down to the most local level possible, I, I tend to believe that people rise to their responsibilities when they're given responsibility. And if you push it down so that the powers that be are now people with names and faces that you're going to see at the grocery store and at the supermarket and the kids' soccer game or whatever, that that gives you a sense that you actually know how to deal with the people who are have have control over your own lives. And I think it would bleed a lot of the toxicity out of our national politics. It would also force people to deal with politics where politics was intended, you know, politics comes from the polis. It comes from a sense of a much smaller unit. Uh, you know, I'm not a huge, you know, Rousseau guy, but Rousseau thought that his idea of, you know, the perfect society couldn't be extended past the size of Geneva. And um, if you can send that power down the most local level possible, you would empower families, you would empower churches and local institutions that would resist the ten- tendency to become sort of clients of the, the government in Washington and bureaucratize. And you would force people to get out of their homes and actually deal with people they disagree with face to face rather than as abstractions that they just deal with on screen screens or um, on, in chat rooms or on Facebook or whatnot. And I think that would be healthy for everybody. Well, Jonah, um, you know, if you're looking for a theological connection for subsidiarity, you might be more comfortable with. It's there in Exodus 18. It's there in <laughs> Jethro's advice to Moses that you're going to wear yourself out if you're trying to do too much. So um, allow me to give some version of that. Jonah, you're doing great work. Try not to wear yourself out too much. Um, enjoy your family. We're looking very much forward to having you here at Acting University next month, June 19th. He'll be joining us on Wednesday evening. Thanks so much for joining us on Act in Line. Can't wait, and thanks for having me. Every year in June, Acton University brings together nearly 1,000 people in Grand Rapids, Michigan, to explore the foundations of a free society. And this year, we're excited to be opening registration for each evening's dinner and plenary session for those who can't attend the full conference. Join us on the evening of June 18 to hear Mary Ann Kalam, a politician in Estonia, speak firsthand about her witness of Soviet-occupied Estonia and her work to champion freedom after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Save your spot at this event before seats fill up and register at actin.org slash events. Hi, I'm Sarah Aldworth, Director of Marketing for the Acton Institute, and I'm excited to welcome our guest, James Patterson, to the show today. James will be visiting Acton on May 30th for the Acton Lecture Series, and he's an Assistant Professor of Politics at Ave Maria University in Florida. His areas of research include race, religion, and American political development. He also has a new book coming out titled Religion in the Public Square, which focuses on three popular evangelists of the 20th century. Today, we'll be talking mainly about the first of these evangelists, the venerable Fulton J. Sheen. James, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Sarah. 
So can you tell me a little bit about the genesis of your new book, Religion in the Public Square? What is it about Fulton Sheen that inspired you to write about him as one of the featured figures? Uh, well, religion and political science does uh, not get quite as much coverage as other factors such as, you know, race, class and and gender. And um, one of the big uh, one of the big things that I wanted to accomplish with this was to talk about religion, but also in a way that tends to get sort of overlooked in political science, which is rather than taking on a more empirical or quantitative approach, I wanted to look at the way specific critical figures in history advocated for public policy, in this case using religious foundations. Uh, and these foundations were very different from one another. Um, in the book, there's a long chapter on Fulton Sheen, and clearly he's using a very different faith tradition, religious foundation from other cases, such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the uh, the Reverend Jerry Falwell, very different people, but they used very similar public policy advocate, uh, uh, public policy strategies and, and foundations. And they advocated um, using mass media and uh, to popularize religious traditions or religious ideas that they had been trained in uh, and and to apply those foundations to certain kinds of outcomes. Like in the case of Fulton Sheen, he wanted to really advocate for an aggressive American posture against totalitarianism, especially communism after the 1950s, as well as to make a very strong case for the capacity for American Catholics to be loyal patriots, which, you know, for much of the 19th century was considered not possible by at least a, a considerable number of American Protestants. So why is Sheen so relevant today? Maybe you can tell me a little bit about the era that Sheen was actively preaching and teaching in, and how is that similar and dissimilar to what's going on today in the world? So Fulton Sheen was born on a farm in El Paso, Illinois, in uh, 1890, and did a lot of farm work uh, and and disliked it immensely. Um, uh, he very famously would would joke about not eating any of the chicken dinners he was uh, sat down and, and invited to eat at because, of course, he had been wringing chicken necks uh, for much of his uh, his young life. So he never wanted to look at another chicken. Uh, uh, the uh, but so he wanted to become a priest uh, very early in life, and um, uh, in the course of of going through seminary, uh, it was become it became very clear that uh, Sheen was an immensely capable person, both in terms of developing languages and understanding philosophical and theological ideas. So they sent him from seminary to the University of Louvain. He started in Catholic University of America, went to the University of Louvain uh, uh, in Europe, and uh, uh, graduated with what's called an agregay, uh, agregay, sorry. Um, I'm not sure if, I, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But uh, it was the sort of advanced doctoral degree and uh, received the highest marks for it. Um, uh, but while this was going on, uh, the United States was in the middle of another anti-Catholic panic. The Democratic Party had nominated in 1928 uh, the New York Governor Al Smith, who was not just Catholic, but he was a wet. He wanted to repeal prohibition. I mean, what a villain. <laughs> um, so uh, there was a pretty significant backlash against um, Catholicism. Now, I, 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 I don't mention it that much in the book, but of course there were a lot of like Catholic political machines that were not terribly, you know, they were, they were pretty the corrupt. The dailies come to mind yeah, in yeah. Chicago. <laughs> so it's not like it was unwarranted, uh, but in many cases it was really excessive, um, especially um, uh, especially as as far as Fulton Sheen was concerned. So he he began a, a public ministry. He had, his first two books he had written while he was at Catholic University as a professor. He returned there after finishing his aggregate. Um uh, were very uh, dusty tomes. One was um, God and Intelligence, and it's called uh, Religion Without God. They're really great books, but I mean, like for like 19 people, they're really great books. For everyone else, you know, maybe, you know, skip them. Uh, but the uh, so he he because of his gifts as a as a sermonizer, as a homil uh, homiletics uh, expert, he was uh, brought on radio to do sort of pro Catholic content uh, at a time when he was. Uh, was still just sort of developing his voice and, and became very quickly a popular figure as, as a result of the early adoption of radio. Tell me a little bit about Sheen's idea of Americanism. What exactly does that mean? You write about that in the book. So this is a fraught topic. Um, actually, like right now in the American Academy among, among Catholics, the, the, uh, Americanism has resurfaced as like a problem, uh, as a heresy. It's sort of quasi-condemned by, by Pope Leo XIII in 1896 and then 1899, although it's sort of unclear 
if that's the sense in which Fulton Sheen uses it, uh, uh, the, at least in the sense that, that, that Leo the Thirteenth condemns it, what we do know is that Fulton Sheen doesn't get any trouble for using the terms that, you know, the popes are actually really excited about Fulton Sheen and his, his capacity to, to lead the charge in the United States. The idea that he's condemning is the, is the notion that uh, the, what Pope Leo the Thirteenth condemned was that the United States would ultimately protect religious liberty as a disestablished sort of church situation where uh, ultimately what Leo XIII wanted was to restore confessional states. So Fulton Sheen wasn't on board with that. Uh, and then apparently, even though he wasn't on board with that, didn't get him into any trouble. And Americanism was also used by nativists or Protestant anti-Catholics uh, who said that Americanism was about sort of liberty of conscience and preventing foreign dictators or foreign tyrants from imposing their will from abroad. And that was really they meant the, the pope. So uh, there's this funny use of the term Americanism where it was used by – it was considered a heresy among some Catholics and was considered a sort of Protestant idea among American Protestants. And here's Fulton Sheen just using it in this completely strange and, and sli- slightly adjusted you know, way, especially uh, not, a fi- not a fan of the, uh, the anti-Protestant uh, arguments, although he does use uh, a narrative that they adopt. Uh, and that's, that's the story of the repression of religious liberty. So for Fulton Sheen, the first uh, uh, idea in Americanism is that the fundamental reason for human existence is, is spiritual well-being found in, as far as he's concerned, the grace uh, mediated through the church. And all institutions need to be oriented around that idea, that people are free to choose their spiritual well-being. Uh, and the second is that the state only has legitimate authority insofar as it defends that liberty or it makes it more possible and better and better informed. So the state did not have any independent claim to the consciences of its citizens, but rather only to defend and perhaps fund institutions that might make spiritual well-being uh, the, uh, the, the most likely outcome. And the third is that, that the, the Antichrist is real, that evil is real in the world. And so... One of the things he picks up from this sort of Protestant understanding of Americanism uh, is that there are foreign threats. And in his view, foreign threats aren't like, like the Vatican. Obviously, he's not going to say it's the Vatican. Foreign threats are, are materialistic tyrants who make bread alone appeals. The idea that, you know, you, you need to be rich, but the rich are taking money from you or, you know, revolution will ultimately liberate you from, from old, old doctrines. These are the people who are really the Antichrist or the evil creatures that – uh, prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. So what he's hoping to uh, what he's hoping to defend in Americanism is a robust sense uh, of of defending against evil by celebrating the political liberty to choose spiritual outcomes. And obviously, this is a way of thinking about Americanism that is specifically tailored to confronting communism, which he 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 deploys it multiple times to do so. So, do you think because of that? Um history of Americanism being more of a Protestant idea, that's why what allowed him to kind of be catapulted into this popularity where he crossed denominations in popularity. I mean, I read that he was appealing to all sorts of people and that he converted people even. And so I'm wondering what you think about how that connects to that Protestant history. So yeah, Fulton Sheen is no stranger to American Protestantism. Uh, Growing up as he did in uh, rural Illinois, he had Catholic uh, and Protestant neighbors. Um, There's some family history with with Protestantism as well, um, which is a sad story about uh, his half sister being taken from the home to be raised by uh, a Protestant family, you know. So this this kind of stuff was all around him. It, be, being born in eighteen ninety, growing up during a period when anti Catholicism was still pretty much a public thing, you know, the Klan was still around, or Ku Klux Klan was still around. There were popular publications like The Menace, sort of was uh, familiar with these things, uh, and he was trying to find a way to sort of preserve Catholicism as he understood it, but also make it friendly enough to, to Protestants that they would be willing to sign on to it. Now, it didn't mean compromising the faith, or at least that's what I, I believe he was, you know. It did mean not sort of like defiantly uh, holding forth uh, at all moments, but instead trying to find common ground, which is what eventually becomes known as the sort of Judeo-Christian tradition. This is a term that's fairly new. We sort of treat it like it's very old, but... Uh, there was a movement afoot when Fulton Sheen was a young priest to kind of bring Jews and Catholics together with Protestants, and and he was on he was on the ground floor trying to bring them together. There's a famous line I think when they rerun the shows on EWTN of his his television show uh, Life is Worth Living. They have the uh, 
the passage from one of his books, I, I think it's Communism and the Conscience of the West, uh, we cannot meet together in the pews, wish to God that we could, but we can at least meet on our knees in prayer. Uh, and so that was the sort of message he had, that there's a common ground here. So in your forthcoming book, you wrote, Sheen defined Americanism in terms of a common commitment to religious liberty endangered by a foreign threat. So given the current state of American political discourse and the general moral confusion in society today, it seems to me that religious liberty is becoming more and more endangered by a domestic threat. Maybe that's the threat of the American nuns, N-O-N-E-S, um, or the groups and you know political persuasions who are actively trying to subvert religious liberty, uh, such as in the case of the contraception mandate of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, just to name one example. So did she never speak to this kind of internal threat? Uh, he did. And when he spoke of it, he, he, he referred to it as the slumming of the intellectuals. Um, he, he, this was especially something he talked about when it was um, what he understood to be sort of liberal Protestants aligning themselves more with sort of socialist ideas than what he thought was sort of an orthodox interpretation of the gospel. And the Protestantism at work there wasn't as important to him as it was the sort of socialism. And the reason for that is um, he saw ideology just as a, as a blanket idea, right, from socialism to fascism to communism, obviously Nazism. These were all things to be condemned because they were essentially ersatz religions that uh, were very poor substitutes uh, for, for the, the faith. And so he, you know, when he talked about the sort of slumming of the intellectuals, one of the things he would constantly target would be elite institutions that essentially free, ro- free road on the religious uh, virtue and the religious liberties of ordinary people. But as they were free riders on this, uh, on this virtue and liberty, they were also debilitating it. So eventually there would be nothing left. He refers to it as the flotsam and jetsam of, of, of religious tradition that people are clinging to as more and more of the ship is damaged and the ship begins to sink. And the ship here in this case is the ship of a state grounded in religious foundations. And in the present, you can see this uh, as people begin to sort of cling to different ideological ideas. It's, there's a pretty strong relationship between people who are not terribly religious and then a, an interest in sort of recovering some sense of spirituality in the absence of any kind of religious faith. So my favorite stuff on this is always the, the odd ideas that emerge from Silicon Valley – where folks are supposed to, you know, uh, be very engineer focused and not very religious. And so they do things like soul cycle or they have like, uh, drug free raves where they have like spiritual experiences. And this is because the Sheen would constantly, uh, argue that, um, the reason that Americanism identifies spiritual flourishing as the primary purpose for the constitutional Republic of the United States is because that's what we're all supposed to be doing. And the sort of attempt to suppress this, uh, will always fail. And instead, what it will do is it'll reach out to things that are sort of a bad religions or very harmful religions. And so it wouldn't have surprised him that this happened. Uh, it, what probably would have done would have saddened him that it is in such a state as it is. It's advancing so quickly and with, so, with such, such a muted response from the church. I also read in your chapter on Sheen that he opposed historical liberalism understood as an ideology generally identified with the doctrine of laissez-faire. Also, you write that he criticized laissez-faire capitalism as the origin of the intellectual and material conditions for the rise of communism. Can you expand on Sheen's economic thinking as it relates to his fight against totalitarianism? How did he square his critiques of the free market system with his condemnation of totalitarianism and communism specifically? Well, I'm mindful of the fact that I'm at the Acton Institute where, uh, you know, uh, it's fighting words, you know, <laughs> but uh, of course, uh, a lot of the things that uh, Fulton Sheen said about historical liberalism and capitalism are both a product of Catholic social teaching at the time and of uh, a sense of the historical failure of laissez-faire uh, capitalism. And what he understood that to be was uh, the the idea of trade and the use of money in the absence of any kind of moral constraint, purely for the purposes of getting the most return on investment and per- and then holding that wealth to the individual who accrued it on the basis of them having a sort of natural right to their money and uh, without any sort of duty or obligation to anyone else. And in, in the consequence of this immense development of, of wealth during the 19th century and its concentration in, in small a number of people, 
you can understand why the large number of people who did not benefit from the system uh, would want to rise up and oppose uh, uh, capitalism. And his response was uh, not to side with the socialists the way that a lot of sort of more left-leaning Protestants did or to side with the capitalists, maybe this way that some some different uh, some uh, different religious groups might. Rather, his response was, these ideologies are incomplete pictures of the human person. Uh, the idea that a person can accrue a massive amount of wealth without any sense of social obligation denies the fact that human beings are fundamentally relational creatures and that wealth comes to a person as a sort of charge for them to care for the community or to uh, you know ultimately provide wealth um, uh, in the form of donations to religious institutions or educational institutions. And one of the, the major failures of laissez-faire capitalism was the instruction under this idea. And so one of the big uh, sort of reforms, I don't talk about too much in the book because there's only so much you can say, right, uh, at one book, but uh, I want to explore in, in future research is uh, the, the recommendations seem almost quaint, but you can see why he makes them. One of them is that he wants, especially in the idea of, you know, if, they're, if the industrialist lives in the same town as the, the factory and the workers, he wants them to worship together because that would emphasize the fact that these are people who are equal under God regardless of their financial situation, and that is a more meaningful sort of relationship. But also that would mean that the laborers would see the man kneeling, right, the, the industrial capitalists are you know, kneeling, and then the industrial capitalists would see all the workers who maybe are doing their best to look good for, for the service, but maybe they're, they're threadbare, or maybe they're a little dirty, and maybe that would then sort of remind the the, the capitalist, that there is something that he should be doing to care for those people. He also wanted there to be sort of revenue sharing from the profits of the, uh, of the firms. You know, but he was no economist. Uh, this was just a way of trying to communicate what he thought would be a responsible way to advance um, the progress that people are making. Like, he's happy that people in America are not starving to death uh, anymore by the 1950s, but he, he wanted there to be a more equitable distribution of the returns on uh, I mean, sorry, of the profits uh, to uh, to to the workers, and this was something that was obviously very popular among the Catholics at the time, considering most of them were in the working class. So he was also speaking to them specifically about what to expect, what to demand from people who employed them. So, is there anything else that you'd like to mention about your book or even your upcoming uh, act and lecture? So the book comes out in May of 2019, uh, "Religion in the Public Square" uh, of Sheen King and Falwell. Uh, it's on the University of Pennsylvania Press. Uh, by the, I think by the early spring, it should be available for pre-order. The, uh, the only thing I would say is uh, to uh, keep a lookout for an article that's sort of something that didn't make it into the book. It's going to probably, I think it's going to be in an early 2019 issue of Providence Magazine. It's going to be on, on King and the civil religion and how the, uh, the, the monument he has in the memorial is maybe not the best way to remember the end. Thanks so much for joining us today, James. Thank you so much. I had a great time. Thank you for listening today. If you have any feedback about this podcast, I would love to hear it. Every week, our podcast team is working to bring you the best show, and we couldn't do it without you. Let me know what you think about this podcast and email me at actinline at actin.org. This episode of Act in Line was produced and edited by me, Caroline Roberts, with audio mixing by Doug Nagel.